Hi guys and welcome to this new video series which is going to look at cluster upgrades to PostgreSQL database servers and I've got split this into three parts. The first part which will be video one is just really about understanding risk in the production environment. It's not very specific to Postgres. It will cover kind of other scenarios, other, you know, it's appropriate for other database engines and everything else. But this is more of a foundational video in part one, just for people who are perhaps new to working in production and how to approach these sorts of changes without creating undue risk. The second video is going to just talk through how a major version upgrade works with Postgres. And then video three is going to be me demonstrating it on a small test cluster running in VirtualBox. So first things first about me, my name is Luke Briner and I work for Smart Survey. I'm the head of technology, which means I help the CTO run platform and I'm also a .NET developer as well. And I've been doing this for quite a long time. Started in C and C++, mainly been in .NET, but I've done Java, I've done Objective-C, I've done PHP, I've done all kinds of things on the way. And just a caveat, I'm not affiliated to PostgreSQL in any way. I'm not part of the core team. I don't work for them or for any of the sort of official sponsors or anything else. I'm just somebody who uses Postgres, who likes it and who wants to help share the love with the rest of you guys. So let's first of all think about what it means to have something running in production. So even if you're a small business, your production in most cases, especially if you're a software as a service business, is really critical to your business functioning. And changing anything in production is a risk. For some businesses, downtime would be a major risk to existing customers and their ability to do their job and to your reputation, which might affect future sales as well. If you were to break something multiple times or have multiple instances of downtime, it's easy for customers to stop trusting you and maybe go to a competitor. And for software businesses, it's even easier for customers to move elsewhere because most of the time they don't have to do anything. They just cancel their subscription and go somewhere else. But at the end of the day, we do have to make changes in production and maybe we make lots of changes every day. So how do we do it safely? How do we minimize the amount of downtime? And there are a few different approaches that people take. This is something, unfortunately, that's all too common in our industry. Uh, it's what I call the it should be all right approach. Uh, and that just means, well, let's just upgrade something. Let's just flick a switch. Let's just run dist upgrade. Let's reboot our server. Let's do whatever. And we kind of use our experience and kind of go, yeah, this should be OK. It should be fine. I don't think there'll be a problem. but. The thing that's wrong with this really is if something goes wrong, we can't always switch back. And that's a, you know, an important principle of doing things safely in production is the ability to flick back to something that was working if your change doesn't work for any reason. And we might not have even assumed that the update, the change, whatever it is that we're doing, is even um, able to fail when we just think well how, how could this fail it's just an upgrade right it's just a you know pseudo apt dist upgrade where it's just a reboot it's just stuff we do every day what's the problem but all of those things can cause you problems when you just kind of do them and hope for the best you know what happens when your web server runs out of disk space during the upgrade what happens when you think everything's finished and it's all gone okay you switch it back online and then find out that one of the subsystems isn't working properly or your Grafana isn't working or Prometheus isn't working or the performance is much worse than the other servers. At that point, you've created a big hole for yourself that can be really difficult to get yourself out of. So not really a great approach. So let's stop doing that. So the second one is usually called a, a canary deployment and we might say it's a, a gradual rollout. So we start by deploying a small number of upgrades or we, we apply an upgrade to a small number of our total servers. So let's imagine we have 50 web servers. And so let's make a change on one and then on the second one and then on the third one. And we keep increasing that percentage until everything's running the new version. And this canary, this you know thing that they used to having when they went into coal mines and stuff where the canary was looking for, for poisonous gas 
and the equivalent for us is saying well if something happens while I'm rolling it out then we're going to see that problem and then we can roll the thing back again. Now it isn't always possible to do a gradual rollout but if it is possible it might seem like a sensible approach right because again we're giving ourselves the option of failing back again if something goes wrong but firstly if you're not sure that your upgrade is harmless which means that you need to run a, a gradual rollout a canary deployment how do you actually know if it works or not because it's a little bit like saying i'm doing this because i know there might be a problem whereas the ideal would be to say well i know there's not going to be a problem so the only reason something's going to go wrong is if maybe like i say a disk fails or a server goes down or whatever but other than that how do you know when it's going to be ready what happens if you deploy everything and it seems okay but then two hours 10 hours 24 hours later something starts going really badly wrong so a gradual rollout is good in some scenarios but it might also cover up the fact that maybe you're not really as clear-cut about what success means for your upgrade for your deployment you're also fighting this need to get the deployment finished right so let's say you've got your 50 web servers you're going to update them one at a time well let's imagine that update takes five minutes well that's 50 so that's 250 minutes and that's going at full speed that's a lot of time that no other deployments are able to take place certainly not safely you want to wait until the whole thing's finished but you're you know fighting against trying to get the thing finished at the same time as trying to be slow enough that you're going to spot any problems how do you balance that and of course the answer is it can be very difficult if your rollout is very large you might be a number of hours into the deployment before you realize there's a problem and then you've got to go through the potentially time consuming process of rolling all of those things back again as well so that's another thing we need to think about and another issue that has affected uh, particularly some cloud providers and this is more common on things like network hardware is what happens when that rollout causes a cascading failure so you deploy to a particular piece of hardware but once you realize that that piece of hardware is gone wrong you try and roll that back but that piece of hardware has already sent the update to another piece of hardware or to 10 other pieces of hardware so you don't actually have the ability necessarily to catch up and to try and, and revert all of those changes you might end up having to switch everything off effectively and do the updates manually to get them back to where they are so again understanding what it is that you're updating and what the potential failure modes are is really important <coughs> so the next kind of deployment model is effectively uh, the C the CLI deployment it kind of says yeah I'm I'm Lee I'm a ninja or whatever that means and I don't need tooling I don't need automation I don't even need processes we'll just write some stuff on the command line and you know maybe we're super pro professional maybe we've created some scripts maybe we've got a few documents and stuff like that you know but of course there are still problems there are still really big risks here despite the fact that again this is something very common the scripts don't always work as expected maybe you tested this on ubuntu 2204 and now you're on 2404 and something's changed a library's changed a system's been replaced with a different one and it doesn't work now if that doesn't work and it's really obvious it doesn't work then okay you might you know recover from it but what happens if it fails halfway through once it's already deleted some stuff or upgraded half the libraries and then fallen over even worse than that is what happens if it seems like it's succeeded but you don't know that there's something that isn't actually working which you only don't find out until later so there's certainly some you know some more dragons here as well maybe you mistype something that's happened before maybe your cat steps onto the enter key or maybe you've just been up really long because this is something you've been planning for months and you're so tired that you just do something that you never would have done if you weren't so tired um, you know mistakes are not just about lack of experience that's a, a common fallacy in software engineering we kind of think well I'm experienced I've done this lots of times before therefore it's not risky of course it's less risky with your experience but the mistakes are there because you're a human not because you lack experience um, GitLab was one example I can think of where the discipline or lack of discipline of using the command line to do certain operations in this case their production database 
led to one of their engineers accidentally starting a delete on the primary replica of a database after the set the only secondary replica had already kind of died a death and they ended up um, basically in a big load of mess and it took them a day um, to actually recover and to lose four hours of stuff in the process not because that engineer didn't know what they were doing but because they were tired they mistyped stuff they were doing it on the command line and they weren't really thinking about a safer way to make the changes they were making so none of those other sort of approaches are really very satisfactory and there is only really one winner when it comes to making changes in production and again i'm kind of thinking here about sort of application deployments and the database upgrade we'll look at later but it's not restricted to that blue green can be used in lots of other scenarios as well and it simply means running up an identical system alongside the old one identical with all of the upgrades updates applied testing the new one you might have tested it already but you can test it once it's all spun up then switching over to the new one and if something really bad happens you can immediately switch back regroup and say right what did we do wrong what went wrong there let's fix it and then let's just repeat it next time without losing your old system in the process of the the switch over and of course this wasn't invented by the it industry we've been doing it on the railways for years and years i used to work in a number of places including signal boxes on the railways and if you upgrade something in a signal box it might be obvious you can't just go in and rip out the old stuff one night put in the new stuff plug it all in and hope it's all going to work you know not only because of safety critical systems but they're important for the running the operation of the trains so you might have six hours of in one night to actually do the work do the changeover so what do you do well what you do is you go in there maybe a week earlier and you install the new equipment alongside but out the way of the old equipment so you don't touch anything that's there that's running that's working you install the new stuff you might do some tests on it you get the power supply working um, you might even run in a you know in this case a few telephones and say yeah this, this all works okay and then you plan to do the swap over part as quickly and as low risk as possible always with the option of being able to switch back to the old equipment if something doesn't work so you might say right all of the new stuff's there i've made all of the wires they're all ready and then on that one night we literally take off the old wires put on the new wires do a load of testing commission it hand it over to the client and then afterwards we can get rid of the old equipment at our own leisure so setting something up alongside switching over to it switching back if we have to but once it's successful we then get rid of the old equipment of course you can do that in two stages as well you might put in something temporarily as a way to make it easy to switch between one and the other but most of the times you should be able to just set up your new equipment and then swap it over in the shortest time possible in most cases that's going to be more work of course there's something quicker about going in somewhere and just swapping something over ripping out the old stuff putting the new stuff in you need less space if we're talking about a physical process but maybe less money less um, capital expenditure depending on where your equipment is but really important that you then say well what happens then if it goes wrong and i could have spent a few hundred pounds on some new kits some new vms whatever but because i've tried to save a bit of money our company's been down for two days while we've had a problem and i've been trying to fix it um, on the fly so there is a an investment sometimes but usually the risk is so much lower that it's worth the um the extra bit now the blue green isn't perfect let's not think this gets away from all of our problems things still go wrong i mean physically things uh, often go wrong cables break um, maybe a switch goes bang because you're switching it off and on and the power spikes or something so in the physical world you would mitigate that by having a couple of spare network switches in you know in their boxes or you know a load of network cables available or whatever it is but again even in the software world you've got to think of the things that might happen while you're doing the upgrade while you're doing a switch over and say so, right if that disk did fail at that point what would i do um, how could i reprovision this machine onto a new disk so that i can get away from the broken disk or all of those kinds of things so it's not perfect but it's definitely the best approach so we should then mention the, the the word downtime bit of a dirty word obviously but we 
probably know without being told that the shortest amount of downtime we can get on a production system the better um, now we can't always get zero but a lot of the time we can probably get fairly close to zero as long as we're careful and again it's about making that switch over point as small as possible if there's a long involved process to switch over clearly the amount of downtime is going to be longer and that might have to be planned downtime but if you're not careful it might be unplanned and you might have a lot of angry customers so if um what are our sort of switching back options ha you know we avoid downtime by not just saying it, if everything goes well it will change over in you know one second but what happens if you switch over and something goes wrong can i switch back as quickly as i can switch over um you know do i have a backup do we have a disaster recovery scenario depending on what you're working on this could be something that would take out your entire system it's not necessarily just some small part of it it might be a major part of it, it might be your main load balancer and you've got to be asking yourself yeah if I, if I break it what are my options for keeping that downtime to a minimum um, and you know we need to consider various kind of risks you mentioned this in the last slide but you know what happens if the files we want to upgrade get corrupted somehow what happens if we accidentally forgot to stop the old server before we started copying the files maybe we accidentally copied the wrong command from stack overflow maybe that's the old command from 10 versions ago you know where are the backups do we know where the backups are do we know how to restore from them do you know how long it's going to take to restore from backup do we even know how to do it i would suggest that a lot of people who do these things in production probably have very little experience of restoring from a backup and might not even know how to do it even if they had to how much data are you willing to lose if something goes wrong in this period of downtime so i mentioned um, gitlab earlier i don't want to pick on them particularly but another part of what went wrong for them wasn't just the fact that the issue occurred in the first place by them accidentally deleting the primary replica rather than a secondary but when they then went to actually restore service again that's when they realized a number of other things were missing their AWS backups of the database weren't working but nobody knew nobody realized the VMs that they were running on weren't being backed up because they supposedly had an AWS backup. So why bother backing up the VM as well? So that wasn't available. And in fact, the only thing they had at the end of the day was a staging copy of the live database, which was four hours behind production. It could have been a lot longer. Fortunately, a staging copy was taken just before this incident happened. So they had to then copy that from cheaper slower storage in one region across the us to the region that their production server ran in and that copy by itself took like 18 hours or something so a lot of their downtime was purely the time of copying that that back up back across to production um, now of course they shouldn't have had the problem in the first place but problems do happen and they obviously hadn't considered what would happen if they needed to copy their however many hundreds of gigs of data uh, across the internet so that ended up being a lot worse so the blue green deployment model does remove a lot of risks from downtime but there are ways as i say that it can go wrong which we do need to consider so let's look at some principles so these are i guess principles for working on things in production they're not it's not from a book or anything like that just things that i've sort of learned over the years of doing this the first one is plan to do something when you want to not when you have to so there's nothing worse than being in the middle of a job of some sort and then you suddenly get a notification this server's gone down something's gone bang etc etc and then you have to do that on the fly you have to decide when to tell your customers that you've screwed up and the system's gone down etc etc that can all be really icky and inconvenient and you're not necessarily your best when you're stressed and anxious about a problem in production whereas if you actually say look we're going to do this once every year we're going to do a major version upgrade for example on our postgres database cluster uh, we're just going to do it once a year by doing it once a year we're hopefully going to stay on top of other problems that we might have and we're running a newer version we've got the latest bug fixes all the rest of it and i can then plan to do it when i've got some time and i don't have to rush and you know i can i can do it all properly the second one is there's no such thing as an easy change 
so again we have this temptation sometimes to be maybe a bit lazy and go oh, i'm just gonna just it's, it's easier just to flick a switch and hope for the best but i remember once before i realized that um, vi sudo was a thing on linux i changed a sudo as file which is a file that allows certain users to perform sudo operations without needing their password so when you get cloud servers that's often set up for your cloud user and I che I was editing one just to add a user to a sudo as file and I got it wrong I got the syntax wrong I ended up completely breaking the server because if you break the sudo system then all of a sudden you can't sudo from anybody and so even my default user couldn't sudo and then I couldn't do anything. I had to kill the server and delete it and start again. Now that was should have been an easy change. If I'd have used the right tool, it would have been an easy change. If I had it documented properly, it would have been an easy change. But what should have been an easy change ended up screwing up my entire server. So there's no such thing as an easy law, uh, easy change. Uh, Murphy's Law is the third one. Uh, you might have heard of that, but I just, yeah, it's obviously one of those things where we think that the one time you don't want it to go wrong is the time it does go wrong. And again, that's probably nonsense, but that's what it feels like. And again, when we're stressed and under pressure, we're more likely to make a mistake. So that's why things do go wrong when we don't want them to. So just be aware that, you know, don't assume that everything's just going to go nice and, and friendly. This is one that came from uh, Bill Baker, who was a Microsoft engineer, worked in on sort of SQL Server and business intelligence and stuff about treating your equipment, your infrastructure like cattle and not pets. And effectively what they're saying is, look, if you use automation well, which is the next principle anyway, you should be able to spin up another server with almost no effort just by running a, a script, running a build, running Ansible, Puppet, Chef, whatever it is. And by doing that, you don't have to be so invested in each individual server. You shouldn't be there messing around with command line, fixing that, doing that script, running that, setting a parameter, blah, blah, blah. All of that can be scripted. So even if you get to that state where you have screwed something up by accident, you say, well, fine, it's cattle. I'll kill it off and I'll just create a new one and I'll start again. Um, getting used to doing that, uh, there's an investment up front in time and learning and money and, and sometimes money. But it really helps you when you're trying to automate things to get rid of those mistakes that happen when you start treating things like pets and doing things randomly on different servers that you forget about. So yeah, automation is your friend. Definitely 100% learn how to automate as much as you can. Then blue green is the best upgrade path. We'll look at this more specifically for um, PostgreSQL in a bit, but we already kind of talked about that. Running up the new one alongside, old one still there, switching over to new, something really does go wrong we can switch back really easily no risk no worry no biggie and then we can look at what went wrong and see if we can either go back to switching over or whether we need to go back and you know start replan it and, and do some more different stuff and always 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 uh, you know i guess the main principle have a failback plan if something does go wrong and i remember this not just because you've done something wrong and you don't think you're going to do something wrong. This is hardware breaking. This is network going down. This is suddenly realizing a firewall rule is not letting you in anymore, which you forgot all about, etc., etc. Always be asking, what's my failback plan? At each step, not just an overall one, but at each step when I make a change, am I doing something that could break? And if I am, what's my failback plan? Um, and then, yeah most of those i think if you stick with those principles that kind of pretty much covers everything that we're going to be doing in this um, postgres one so this is just an example here let's we've got a mail server running on ubuntu 20.04 and we want to upgrade our ubuntu's to 22.04 the next lts release after 20.04 and of course the easiest laziest way to do it is we log into that server we probably take it out of the load balancer or whatever system uses it and we go in there and we just do you know sudo apt update and then sudo apt dist upgrade dash yes bang um, and we hope for the best and of course most of the time that will work you know exactly as we expect it to work it will upgrade everything it should be fine but of course straight away that all these risks that we talked about uh, disk full that's always a bit of a, a nasty one because there's a lot of stuff stops working properly when you run out of disk space so you might have to tidy that up. But of course, the other thing is when you go up a major version of an OS, there's a good chance that your mail server software, let's say Postfix, might have been pinned to one version in 2004, and now it's pinned to a different version 
in 22.04 so as soon as you do the disk upgrade you're not just upgrading the os you're potentially upgrading your mail server software now if you're lucky uh you'll then realize that it's gone wrong something you know monitoring is going to show you an error or whatever you try and send an email and it doesn't work and you kind of realize your foolishness but even if you do realize there's a problem you you're still left with a broken server and a load of other mail servers to upgrade so you haven't really gained anything other than a balked server uh, but of course the worst one is it might seem to work but maybe some of the parameters are, are changed maybe the defaults have changed and therefore your mail server doesn't work properly anymore maybe it's slower maybe it um you know gets blocked more easily by by somebody else so what do we do while well, the bottom shows the, the the blue green approach really we leave the existing mail server where it is and we create this new one down here and say yep yeah, we'll just create a brand new one completely from scratch 2204 and because we love automation and that's a great principle and a great practice we're going to install our mail server from ansible puppet chef whatever and we're going to test this alongside and then once we're happy and we go yeah this all seems to work we can run our you know run our mail through it, all the rest of it we then flick over our load balancer or whatever to point to the new mail server and say yeah we don't need to use this one anymore but we can leave it running alongside and we can leave it running alongside depending on our business risk for as long as we want to pay for that old server maybe we do want to leave this running for a couple of days you know four or five days so if we do suddenly realize the performance is terrible well it's easy we just flick it back to the old one and that hasn't changed since we were last using it because we didn't do an in-place upgrade we've got that there as our safety net and of course depending on the automation you could potentially destroy that and recreate it with 2004 if you wanted to but at some point in the future you get rid of the old system and you're left with one server and the only real cost of this which is the nice thing about blue green is okay you're running two vms for a period of time but how much is a small vm for a week you know 10 20 quid 20 bucks something like that it's not a lot of money and you're getting rid of a load of risk of screwing things up and not having a failback plan so then last slide for this video just to sort of introduce what we're going to be looking at next so here we're talking about postgresql postgres whatever you want to call it and we're saying here that we have a version 14 uh, cluster set up already which i have set up in virtualbox with a primary and two standby replicas and what we want to have is the same thing running the same databases but running on version 15. so let's have a version 15 primary two version 15 replicas and we're basically asking how do we get from this to this obviously using blue green because we've decided that's the best way to do it so in the next video we're going to look at the options available in postgresql we're going to look at the pros and cons of each of them and then we're going to say why using logical replication is the best way to get a not only a safe migration but a migration with the shortest amount of downtime so Stay tuned and I'll see you in the next video.